Okay, so okay. I guess we sh we should uh, slowly start the um, the f the formal part then of um, introducing uh, Megan Aronson, who's from University of British Columbia, where she's uh, dean of the Faculty of Science, but still gets time to do some some research. Um, she's had a, an illustrious career um, in, in Texas. Um, also working at Brookhaven, leading the condensed matter group uh, or a condensed matter group there at the University of Michigan. Um, she's a fellow of the American Physical Society and recently the, the Neutron Scattering Society of America. Um, we're looking forward to, to her, her talk and absolutely delighted to have her speak to us uh, today. So the format of the presentation is that we'll have uh, usually a talk it's about 45 minutes. If people have questions, then please put them in the chat. And then I'll try and stop Megan and give you a chance to ask your question. And then at the end, there's a 45 minutes for, for discussion. And then after that, Pierce will take the reins and um, lead on the uh, poster prize. OK, thank you very much. If you'd like to share your screen, Megan, and you can tell us what your title is. Thank you so much. Uh uh, Andrew, and of course, it's it's uh, wonderful to uh, uh, have this opportunity to uh, be with you. Uh, so, good morning from uh, uh, from Vancouver. Um, uh, and uh, what I'd like to uh, 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 talk to you today uh, is about uh, the idea of uh, metallic spin chains and the extent to which electronic correlations uh, could be controlled uh, in uh, these uh, uh, these uh, sorts of systems. So, as um, whoops. As uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, I have the pleasure of being uh, the uh, co-investigator with Alana Hallis of the Quantum Materials Discovery Lab uh, at uh, UBC. And uh, here are the uh, wonderful uh, junior colleagues uh, who are uh, the ones who are uh, making uh, this, uh, this research uh, all uh, possible. Uh, so as always, I take at, as my, uh, my inspiration, uh, the diversity of sorts of behaviors that are possible in correlated electron systems. Uh, and um, uh, I think uh, like many on this call, uh, they, uh, it's endlessly fascinating uh, to see the different sorts of phases that are possible. And in particular, uh, that we have some ability to manipulate uh, these, uh, these phases. And uh, what we've learned, I would say over the years is that there is some commonality. There are some, uh, some uh, themes uh, in particular that uh, uh, if we have a system like this uh, heavy fermion serine plating to silicon two, if we were to apply pressure, the antiferromagnetic order could be suppressed. And just where it's about to disappear, uh, instead there's this little bubble of uh, superconductivity that emerges. Uh, and you see something different, in, uh, something similar uh, in these, in these uh, different systems that I've indicated here. And it uh, really speaks to the importance of understanding st the stability of different phases at zero temperature, uh, not only on, on uh, not only uh, to understand how you destabilize a certain phase, but that the new modes uh, that are liberated uh, by destabilizing that phase in turn are recycled uh, and used uh, to generate uh, additional sorts of order, uh, in particular unconventional uh, superconductivity. So the theme of our research uh, is uh, to try to find new materials uh, where we can study different aspects of these uh, quantum critical points uh, in, uh, in new ways. And in this talk, I'm going to focus uh, on uh, a new compound uh, that uh, we'd argue is an example of a metallic magnetic uh, chain. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Our work is, uh, I guess, in its simplest terms, uh, trying to discover new sorts of magnetic quantum critical points. Uh, and you might ask yourself, well, uh, you know, how hard of a how hard of a of a problem really is that? Uh, and uh, you know, the phase diagram that you see here suggests a possible route, which would be, uh, say you have a system that's magnetically ordered, uh, we apply pressure, field, composition, something, uh, and the nail temperature drops and uh, disappears at a certain point. Uh, and so we know from the mean field uh, that there is an exchange interaction that's responsible for this ordering temperature. Uh, and so essentially with the tuning, we just need to make that exchange interaction zero. So that's not a very practical uh, way of uh, thinking about this. At the, uh, you know, there's of course the very practical question about you know, being able to make an exchange interaction zero. Uh, that's not very convenient. And what's more, uh, the range of temperatures over which you'd see uh, the quantum critical behavior would also shrink uh, if you made uh, J go to zero. 
So a more practical approach uh, uh, is, uh, is taken, which is that we might um, choose systems where we know that quantum fluctuations are strong. Uh, they could be uh, systems that are low dimensional, uh, those that are on um, lattices uh, that would lead to frustrated or competing interactions, uh, or those uh, where uh, we have uh, the formation of, uh, of uh, dimers uh, or other kinds of systems that could be uh, some mixture of localized and delocalized. Uh, so as a simple example, I'll, uh, I'll uh, show you uh, uh, the impact of uh, frustration. Uh, and uh, the uh, simple example, of course, is that if we have a triangle with spins on the, on, uh, the vertices of the triangle, uh, you can see that there are six different ways uh, to organize those spins if you have an antiferromagnetic interaction among them. And so each of these uh, is uh, equally uh, likely uh, for this uh, individual triangle system. And so you can see uh, that we've already generated a, a considerable amount of degeneracy uh, in this system. Imagine though uh, that we don't have one triangle, but 10 to the 23rd triangles, and you can have some appreciation for the amount of uh, low energy uh, and uh, fluctuations the many configurations of uh, the system that are very nearby, and so that the system is free to move among those, uh, those systems uh, uh, leading to uh, the strong uh, fluctuations. So that particular uh, approach, of course, uh, has been um, uh, broadly studied. Uh, there are many materials that are based on these sorts of triangular motifs, uh, and uh, most of them uh, have, uh, have uh, displayed a significant amount of uh, frustration in the sense that magnetic order happens at a much lower temperature uh, than you would have uh, expected given any one of the exchange interactions. So the, the, uh, that those, uh, the frustration, the low dimensionality, the dimerization are all things uh, that one could pursue uh, in insulating compounds. Uh, but if we have a metallic compound, there's a second way that we can uh, suppress magnetic order and that is by suppressing the magnetic moment itself. Uh, and so uh, here I'm going to uh, you know, show you a simple example of uh, how that works. We imagine that we would start at high temperature and we might have some spatially localized um, moments that uh, might come from D or F electrons. In addition, uh, we have uh, some uh, conduction electrons in the system and there's some exchange coupling between uh, the two. Two things can happen. Uh, on the one hand, the exchange coupling can be strong enough uh, that the conduction electrons can compensate uh, the uh, localized moments. And in this way, uh, those previously localized electrons uh, can be induced to join uh, the Fermi surface, which is now enlarged. Uh, in this case, uh, the delocalization of the electrons suppresses their magnetic character. And what we end up with uh, is uh, a Fermi liquid or uh, a regular metal uh, where the magnetism uh, that was originally associated with the delocalized electrons, uh, sorry, the localized electrons now just persist as uh, correlations. On the other hand, uh, it could be uh, that the interactions among the local um, electrons themselves could be sufficiently strong uh, that you drive uh, magnetic order. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, that magnetic order occurs in the presence of uh, the conduction electrons, but there's no strong coupling between the two. So as you go to low temperatures, you have magnetic order, you have robust moments just as you did at high temperature. So this shows us then that as a function of this exchange interaction J prime, uh, we, could, uh, we could imagine at zero temperature, a transition from uh, this state where we have magnetic order and localized electrons uh, to a state where there is no magnetic order and only the most, uh, uh, the most tenuous of magnetic uh, behavior. Uh, and uh, that, uh, the, uh, the, that this, um, that this uh, quantum critical point then uh, should uh, be accompanied by a change in the Fermi surface uh, volume. So this is clearly physics uh, that can only be uh, experienced uh, in, uh, in metals. So these two factors uh, are brought together in this, uh, in this um, stylized uh, phase diagram uh, that was uh, uh, proposed some time ago, uh, where the quantum fluctuations are, uh, are uh, if you increase the quantum fluctuations, you can suppress the propensity for magnetic order. And above a critical value, there is no more order uh, that is possible and you have a spin liquid. Uh, but in this case, you have robust magnetic moments uh, throughout. On the other hand, uh, the uh, delocalization uh, sort of transition uh, that I described to you on the last slide happens uh, when you have, uh, uh, for instance, no quantum fluctuations, uh, and we use pressure or composition, for instance, to increasingly delocalize the moments uh, to the point where they give up 
uh, and go from having a small to a large uh, Fermi surface above some critical value of that pressure. And of course, uh, most materials will be somewhere in between those two axes, somewhere uh, along uh, this line. And that is, of course, what is of most interest because uh, I think there's uh, some, uh, some thought uh, that unconventional superconductivity likely involves both kinds uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of uh, quantum fluctuations. Uh, and so uh, there is, of course, uh, uh, at the same time, a need to develop new materials uh, that would allow you to explore different parts of uh, this space diagram. Uh, and uh, so what I'm going to uh, tell you about today is a system that we think is very close to being a spin liquid. And whether or not it has larger but a small value of gamma turns out to be an incredibly hard question to answer uh, at this point. Uh, so right. this is, yeah. Megan, could, could you just comment on, you've got superconductivity marked on your graph and a break between the small and large Fermi surfaces in the disordered and the ordered states. Would you, are you going to say more about that or is it appropriate to say something now? Um, I'm, I don't think that I'll uh, necessarily return to it. It's not part of the physics that I'm reporting today. Um, so why do, uh, you know, what's the evidence uh, that uh, you need to be, uh, so you need to, I think that, uh, that you need to be near a quantum critical point, that is along this line, uh, uh, in order to, you know, to have the low energy modes that could be used to build unconventional superconductivity. I'm not talking about conventional superconductivity, uh, which presumably could happen you know, out here. Uh, I would say that if you have too robust of magnetic moments, uh, that that's probably not good uh, for superconductivity because of you know, uh, uh, pair breaking for the most part. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't have enough magnetism, uh, that is if you're uh, you know, really trying to suppress, uh, uh, suppress the magnetism, it is possible to have superconductivity here, but I think that perhaps the most interesting are the ones that are in this regime where you have a, very, a weakness of order. Uh, so you have like a spin liquid to a Fermi liquid kind of transition. Uh, that's uh, the reason why I, I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, suggesting this possibility. Sorry, just on the topology of the phase diagram, why the two, the dashed line and the solid blue line are not connected to each other? Um, uh, I don't know that there's uh, any experimental evidence that would necessarily require that. Uh, that, you know, that I think this is probably not a phase transition, but probably uh, I view this more as a, uh, this one is uh, as a uh, crossover. Uh, this is a line that is inside the ordered phase, so it potentially is a, it is a, it is a phase uh, transition. No particular reason. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, a system uh, that uh, we think is a one-dimensional uh, compound. Uh, and there are several uh, you know good features about uh, about uh, one dimensions. And the first is uh, that uh, quantum fluctuations are naturally strong in these uh, systems. And that comes to us from the Norman Wagner theorem. And I'll try to explain that uh, using pictures and simple words. Uh, so here's a chain, uh, let's say it could be atoms, it could be magnetic moments. Um, uh, and we would say that uh, each one of these uh, moments, for instance, uh, has some uh, uncertainty uh, with respect to its position. It's uh, perhaps um, uh, has some sort of um, uh, fluctuation. And the question that you could ask is, if uh, this uh, first uh, moment were to fluctuate, uh, how far away uh, would that fluctuation be experienced? Uh, and the answer is not very far away at all, uh, in that in one-dimensional systems, uh, the correlations fall off uh, very quickly uh, as a function of, uh, of uh, distance. And that means then that the correlations are short-ranged, as in a liquid or, uh, or a gas, uh, and that you cannot drive a two-phase transition uh, at least in an isolated chain, uh, because the correlations don't persist over sufficiently long uh, length scales. So that's, uh, that's a, a very uh, positive uh, aspect of, um, of uh, one-dimensional systems. And the, the second I would say is that when you have a one-dimensional system, there are experimental tests or theoretical tests uh, that will tell you that that's the case. In particular, they have uh, a signature excitation, which is uh, the spin-on. Of course, uh, uh, the spin-on uh, is uh, some, you know, uh, can be understood by starting with an antiferromagnetic chain, uh, and if you reverse one of the spins, uh, that changes the spin by one unit, uh, and the system tries to heal uh, that uh, 
uh, that uh, defect uh, by generating two domain walls that carry away, each carrying away half of that spin. So those domain walls are known as the spin-ons, uh, and they are considered to be part of an electron, a fractionalized uh, electron, since they have the spin, but not the charge uh, of uh, the electron. Uh, since the energy cost uh, for generating the spin-ons grows with their separation, uh, the spin-ons then are, uh, have to be confined uh, into the chains unless there's coupling between the chains. Uh, and uh, fortunately, uh, that uh, the uh, spin-on spectrum can be studied using neutron scattering measurements or uh, angle resolved uh, photo emission uh, measurements. Uh, so that's a definite, if you see spin-ons uh, in a system that you suspect to be one-dimensional, uh, then uh, that is, uh, that is uh, strong evidence that you do have a one-dimensional system. Uh, so here's an example of what the spin-on spectrum looks like. Uh, these are data on uh, copper sulfate. Uh, on the left, you see uh, sort of the, uh, this uh, fan-like uh, kind of, uh, of uh, spectrum that is determined um, uh, uh, experimentally. And on the right uh, is a calculation of the spectrum uh, that's based on uh, the parent Hamiltonian, which is the XXC uh, Hamiltonian. And you can see uh, that there's a high degree of correspondence between theory and experiment that's possible. Uh, that tells you first, this is a 1D system, and secondly, that it's governed by this, uh, by this Hamiltonian. So and I'm Megan, to... yes. Megan, can, can you uh, remind us why they used uh, deuterium uh, rather than hydrogen here? Um, yes, uh, so copper sulfate is naturally um, uh, hydrogenated, I suppose. It, it absorbs water. Uh, and uh, so the hydrogen uh, or the protons in, uh, in the water uh, will dominate the scattering uh, of the neutrons. Uh, and so if you put in uh, the deuterium, uh, then uh, the, the copper spin a half, uh, which is uh, what's behind these oh, applications will have a chance. Oh, that's great, thank you. So copper sulfate uh, is of course a very uh, intriguing uh, material, but it's a hard insulator and in that the Coulomb interaction is much stronger than the hybridization. Uh, and, uh, and so, and, and uh, both of them are much larger than the exchange, of course. So what we'd be looking for uh, is a system that would not be an insulator. Uh, so that means that U over W uh, would, be, uh, would be smaller. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, we would like to uh, find a material where U over W is near the critical value to drive a Mott transition. Uh, that is uh, ultimately what our aim is in this work. And the one dimensionality is important uh, because it will, uh, it will uh, suppress uh, the uh, tendency uh, for uh, the magnetic moments that would be generated by the Mott transition to immediately order. That is uh, the idea. So uh, in fact, uh, our first uh, try at, uh, at that uh, physics was in this F-electron compound deuterium 2 platinum 2 bed. Uh, and uh, here are the uh, wonderful collaborators uh, that uh, uh, we all work together on this uh, on uh, this project, and here are some of the uh, papers uh, that uh, came out of this. Uh, and we'll just give you a brief um, uh, sense of that work. Uh, Eutermium two platinum two lead is really a unique uh, material uh, in the sense uh, of its uh, structure. It is a uh, it is a, uh, a ladder uh, sort of compound uh, where uh, the unit cell has two ladders uh, that are orthogonal to each other. And so if you look in the plane perpendicular to the ladder axis, uh, you find what's uh, shown here. Uh, these are the ladder rungs that you're looking down on. And you can see uh, that each one of them is decorated uh, by uh, a terbium diamond. So this is the Shastri suburban lattice. The terbium moments here are in a nearly pure state of J is equals plus or minus seven half. So it's a pseudo spin a half ground state. And there's very strong uh, Ising anisotropy as a result of uh, the magnitude of J Z. I need to prove to you first that this is a metallic system, and that comes from the resistivity, which is plotted here at the right. Uh, it's a good metal. The residual resistivity is quite low. And we know as well uh, that the terbium moments are coupled to the conduction electrons because there's this drop in spin disorder scattering at the antiferromagnetic transition, which is about 2 Kelvin. Nonetheless, uh, we think that this is a small Fermi surface uh, compound. Uh, where the eutrubium moments are weakly coupled to the conduction electrons. There's no evidence, for instance, of a condo effect uh, in this system. So like the copper sulfate, uh, in this material, neutron scattering measurements uh, do display uh, this span-like uh, spin-on um, uh, spectrum uh, of the uh, spin-ons uh, in the eutrubium 2 platinum 2 bed. Uh, and uh, here is a calculation of uh, the spectrum that comes from uh, the XXC uh, Hamiltonian. 
So we were very pleased, of course, uh, that uh, this metallic system showed this uh, showed spin-ons. Uh, but what we found was that there's really no difference uh, in uh, the spectrum uh, compared to what would happen if this deuterium 2 platinum 2 red were for some reason an insulator. Uh, and it's perhaps not too surprising because after all, you know, the spin-ons are fractionalized ex uh, excitations. Uh, they are purely magnetic. Uh, and so the presence of additional charges from whatever source uh, uh, really should not uh, influence them. And I guess we uh, perhaps proven experimentally that that's the case uh, in uh, ytterbium 2 platinum 2 bed. So the, next, uh, uh, so the next experiment that we'd like to do, of course, uh, would uh, try to, uh, would be like taking the F electrons in the ytterbium and cranking up the exchange interactions so you'd have a condo effect. Uh, and so the magnetism would be uh, perhaps a little bit uh, less uh, uh, robust. Uh, and so that turned out not to be uh, possible, uh, but instead uh, we took a different approach. Uh, so what we're trying to do uh, is, uh, if we look at this picture of uh, the Mott uh, transition, uh, we, you know, we know that we can see spin-ons in an insulating system, uh, and we would like to uh, uh, increase the, the uh, hybridization in such a way uh, that we uh, actually go through uh, a, the transition where we develop a, a Fermi surface, which is initially represented by this very sharp density of states that broadens out uh, with increased, uh, uh, um, increased uh, hybridization. So we'd like to find a system that is uh, uh, here close to the Mott transition itself. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the reason for that is that we'd like to simultaneously study the localization of the electrons in the 1D system uh, and uh, their possible role uh, in uh, stabilizing uh, magnetic order. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about a material that's based on manganese, uh, and I think that it's not broadly appreciated, really, uh, the range of magnetic behaviors uh, that manganese uh, can uh, display. And to, and to show you that, uh, I've uh, basically tabulated here uh, a lot of different uh, uh, manganese square net compounds. So all these are different uh, structures that have manganese square nets. Uh, and the ordered moment uh, can go from almost five Bohr magnetons per manganese uh, down to less than two Bohr magnetons uh, per manganese. Uh, and uh, and uh, so those two limits are commonly understood uh, as being related uh, to uh, the spin states uh, for divalent man manganese. So manganese 2 plus has 5D electrons. Uh, and so in the presence of an octahedral crystal field, uh, you will split those states into the T2G and EG states. Uh, and uh, if you have strong Huns interaction plus Coulomb interaction, uh, then uh, it's optimal to, um, uh, to have single occupancy of each of those, uh, of those states. And that gives you a high spin, of five, which is 5.9 per magnetons per manganese. On the other hand, uh, there are uh, situations uh, where uh, the Huns interaction uh, is weak compared to the octahedral field, or possibly this whole picture fails. Uh, and in those cases, you can have a low spin state uh, where the EG states are unoccupied and everything is in all the five electrons are uh, accommodated in the T2G states. And this leads to a spin a half state. Uh, this is the low spin, low spin configuration uh, for manganese. Uh, and it has uh, something less than uh, two Bohr magnetons uh, per manganese. Uh, so you could question uh, the extent to which uh, this, uh, this works in systems that are, are not uh, insulating. I certainly do. Uh, but I think that it's generally felt uh, that, uh, that those sorts, uh, that uh, 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 systems that are on this end with the large moments uh, are uh, close to this. And in fact, these are insulators. So that's a reasonable uh, statement. But what is interesting to me is that once the, uh, once the ordered moment gets around three Bohr magnetons, uh, there uh, seems to be uh, a transition uh, because all the, uh, all the uh, um, additional manganese compounds on this plot uh, are on, uh, that with, uh, with moments less than three Bohr magnetons are metals. So we have metals on this side, we have insulators on this side, and we have some sort of a transition period, uh, transition region through here, uh, and as well, uh, if I overplot with the Sommerfeld constant uh, for these compounds, you can see that there's a general growth in the Sommerfeld constant as we go towards uh, three Bohr magnetons or, or, or so. So there's not, I'm not uh, going to suggest an explanation uh, for these data. Uh, this is just to uh, point out to you uh, that there is some, uh, some suggestion 
uh, that the manganese moments can be uh, destabilized uh, and that that could be associated with a mod like transition. Megan, could you just say what the x axis is on the graph? This is a list. This is a visual list. Uh, so this is, it's it's just an index. The, there's, you know, some, num maybe 30 compounds here, 40 compounds yeah. here. Uh, so uh, it's just, they're listed in the order of the size of their moment. Yeah, okay, got it. Thank you. So what do we do with that information? And so the answer is, we want to identify uh, using pure thought, uh, a material based on manganese, uh, uh, where uh, the manganese moment uh, is unstable. Uh, and uh, so fortunately, uh, we're not the first people uh, who've uh, thought about this. Um, this is some interesting, uh, these are some interesting data uh, that uh, were uh, published on this uh, series, Rare Earth Manganese 2. And so what's plotted here is the manganese moment. Uh, so the rare earth moment is uh, out of the picture. And you can see that as you go from chrysidymium to neodymium to terbium, to dysprosium, that there's a steady decrease in the, mang in the manganese moment. Then at dysprosium, there's a sudden drop in the manganese moment. Uh, and then for the subsequent uh, rare earths, nothing. Uh, there's no manganese moment uh, at all. Uh, and so it was recognized uh, by WADA uh, that the control parameter really here is the manganese-manganese spacing. Uh, that uh, what you find is if the manganese-manganese spacing is large, that you have robust magnetic moments, but if it's less than this critical value, uh, then you have no magnetic moments and you just have weak fluctuating uh, magnetism. Uh, so uh, more or less you can say uh, that the manganese moment vanishes at a critical manganese manganese spacing, 2.65 angstroms. So how does this map onto our picture of uh, the Mott transition? Well, the Coulomb interaction and the Hun's interaction uh, do not vary significantly uh, among different manganese compounds. And so the control parameter really needs to be the, must be the exchange. And so 2.65 more magnet, uh, 2.65 angstroms then uh, is some critical, uh, corresponds to some critical value of that hybridization. So the way it works is this. Uh, so if you have a material where the manganese moments, where the ma manganese moments are well separated, then uh, the Coulomb interaction is larger than the hybridization and you'll have um, strong magnetic moments uh, and localized electrons you bring them together, the hybridization becomes more important uh, and uh, this suppresses the magnetic moment uh, and you have weak fluctuating uh, magnetism uh, as, uh, as in a metal. Uh, and so our goal uh, then is to take this information and we would say, okay, we need to comb through the International Crystal Structure Database, all 400,000 compounds there. And what we're looking for is a material that has, whose only magnetic entity is manganese, uh, that the manganese are arranged in a chain-like sort of uh, morphology and where the manganese-manganese spacing along the chain is in the neighborhood of 2.6 to 2.7 angstroms. That's what we're looking for. So that material uh, actually, uh, I guess, does exist. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, through the brilliance of my, uh, of my colleagues uh, who are represented here uh, that we were able both to find it. Uh, I think uh, Hua Hair is the one uh, who initially suggested this material, uh, but Abhishek Pandey, who's now in South Africa, uh, is uh, the mastermind of the, uh, of the experiments that I'm going to tell you about. And uh, these initial results uh, were reported last year. So the compound uh, is, of course, titanium four manganese bismuth two. Uh, and uh, it has a truly remarkable structure. Uh, so as advertised, uh, the uh, fundamental element of the structure are these chains of manganese where the manganese are separated by about 2.4 angstroms. Uh, so if you look down on these chains, that's uh, this view here, you see that the chains, the red chains or the manganese chains are pretty far apart, 7.5 angstroms. Interestingly, each one of those chains is surrounded by a concentric tube uh, initially of bismuth, and then a larger concentric tube of titanium. So this is like a cage compound uh, in that respect. It's like a capsule, as is, uh, as is uh, indicated over here. So at 2.4 angstroms, uh, what we would have expected is that the manganese-manganese um, separation indicates a quite strong uh, exchange. Uh, and so we should uh, be close, we should be in the non-magnetic limit. Uh, so we would expect to see a metal with correlations. 
but we're not so far away uh, from a critical value uh, where one would see uh, an emerging magnetic moment and the possibility of a magnetic order. Uh, so that's the prediction. And, uh, and so uh, I will uh, turn to the experiments and you can see how we did. Uh, so the first thing, of course, I have to convince you is that this is in fact a metal. Um, and so here's the resistivity plotted as a function of temperature. Uh, it's a decent metal. Uh, the, residual, the residual resistivity is pretty high. Uh, it's not very sample dependent. Uh, and uh, the resistivity, the temperature dependence is well described by the block gunaisen uh, expression uh, in particular, if we add conduction electrons scattering from D electrons. Uh, importantly, at low temperature below 75 Kelvin, one finds that the resistivity is convincingly quadratic with respect uh, to temperature. So this is a conventional Fermi liquid um, uh, uh, metal. The specific heat uh, uh, data are plotted here in the center. Mostly what you see uh, with on, uh, in this uh, figure is uh, the phonons, but in addition, uh, there's a small uh, gamma T term, an electronic term at low temperature. Uh, and in fact, the Sommerfeld co uh, coefficient is not that small for a manganese compound. It's 57 millijoules per mole Kelvin squared. Uh, and so we can compare the magnitude of the T squared coefficient uh, and the Sommerfeld constant uh, through the Katawaki woods ratio. That's shown here in the graph at the right. Uh, and titanium four manganese bismuth two is located here on the D electron line, uh, which uh, places it uh, uh, at, in the moderate to strong electronic uh, correlation uh, regime, perhaps similar to the strontium ruthenates, something like that. Uh, so we find uh, that uh, this is a reasonably correlated uh, metal, uh, which uh, could be uh, what we might have uh, predicted. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, the, the, this is the inverse of the magnetic susceptibility plotted as a function of temperature. Uh, the black line is the Curie-Weiss uh, fit that includes a constant susceptibility. Uh, and you can see that down to 50 Kelvin or so uh, that uh, you do see a Curie-Weiss uh, susceptibility. And uh, remarkably, the effective moment is uh, 1.79 Bohr magnetons per manganese, which is extremely close to uh, what we would expect for the uh, spin a half state uh, for manganese 2 plus. This is pretty rare. Me uh, Megan? Yes. Uh, chi inverse doesn't seem to be a very clean straight line. It's more like a power law. Um, any comment on that? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, there's, there's a relatively large temperature independent susceptibility that hasn't been subtracted. This is the measured inverse susceptibility. I uh, see. And yeah. Uh, so that's why it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't so if you subtract that, you get a straighter line. That's, that would have been my preference on how to present these data, correct? Okay, great. So in any case, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, exciting and, and odd uh, that uh, for manganese two plus, we actually do see the low spin configuration. That's not very uh, usual at all. Uh, it could be that for some reason in the structure, we have a particularly strong octahedral field. Uh, that's uh, unknown. Uh, uh, but another factor, which I think is perhaps uh, more um, important is uh, we should ask whether we have a whether we have a rigorous manganese two plus, and uh, this is a metal, uh, so we should expect uh, significant valence fluctuations. Uh, and so perhaps, well, there's no need to uh, speculate as to why this happened, uh, other than it did. Uh, from uh, the vice temperature, which is minus nine point three Kelvin, uh, we see that uh, the uh, overall uh, interactions uh, should exchange interactions should be antiferromagnetic, and using the mean field expression. Uh, and assuming uh, that the dominant um, exchange interaction is along uh, the chain, uh, we would estimate that interaction at uh, being 18 Kelvin, uh, and uh, so uh, about 1.3 millivolts. And uh, here's uh, uh, Pierce's point, uh, which is uh, there's a relatively strong uh, susceptibility, uh, uh, temperature independent susceptibility uh, that's uh, detected here, uh, and uh, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, that it is more or less explained uh, by the density of states uh, from uh, the uh, DFT calculations. So it's a poly susceptibility. So here are those uh, DFT uh, calculations. Um, uh, and uh, so this on the left is the density of states broken out by the different um, atom types. Uh, you can see that the states at uh, the Fermi level are dominated uh, by uh, titanium. Uh, and uh, that the manganese states uh, are a broad peak uh, that uh, is, that is uh, located away uh, from, uh, from the, the Fermi level. Uh, and uh, the, 
the ener that uh, that energy and uh, the bandwidth uh, would place uh, this uh, compound uh, if it was just up to the manganese uh, at uh, at a Amat uh, transition. Uh, uh, so, uh, given that uh, that thought, uh, uh, spin polarized um, calculations were also carried out, uh, and those results are shown on the left. These are all these are purely uh, manganese states, and it was found that only the blue dx squared minus y squared and the red dxy uh, orbitals uh, have a propensity to bear a, a small magnetic moment. Uh, and uh, so the prediction then would be that this material should be antiferromagnetically ordered, uh, but that the magnetic moment is limited just to these two, uh, to these, uh, two orbitals uh, with the remaining orbitals remaining delocalized and uh, presumably not magnetic. Uh, so here then is a picture of the susceptibility as a function of temperature. Uh, we saw the uh, higher temperature data here, which uh, followed the Curie-Weiss uh, behavior. But below 15 Kelvin or so, uh, you can see that there we developed some anisotropy uh, in that uh, the data uh, that were obtained with the field perpendicular to the C-axis provides a larger susceptibility than if uh, the field is along the C-axis. And you see that there's this broad peak uh, that happens uh, with a maximum around two uh, Kelvin that suggests that there's uh, antiferromagnetic order uh, that's uh, present, uh, but relatively short range. Uh, further evidence uh, for that uh, magnetic order is found in the specific heat. This is a plot of C over T versus T. Uh, and you can see that there's this uh, broad peak uh, near 1.9 Kelvin. And if we subtract out the phonons, uh, we can actually uh, see uh, the ordering peak itself. Again, very broad. Uh, and so uh, the magnetic order then uh, is uh, uh, presumably short-lived or short-range uh, or both. Uh, so weird, somebody is drawing on my screen. Thank you. Um, uh, on the, uh, at the same time, well, we can integrate under this peak to get some idea uh, of, uh, of the um, entropy associated with, uh, with that order. Uh, and that's uh, shown here uh, at, the, at the right. Uh, the entropy develops very slowly, uh, consistent with short range order. And in addition, it never gets higher than about 9% of R log two. So that tells us that, you know, uh, uh, you know broadly speaking, about 91% of the manganese moments are not uh, ordered, uh, let's say, uh, at any instant in time. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a, a scenario of weak uh, magnetic order. So how do we think about that? Uh, well, again, we have kind of two options uh, that, we, uh, that we go to. Uh, and the first is maybe this is a scenario that's associated with uh, itinerant manganese magnetism. Maybe the manganese moments are in fact extremely itinerant uh, and we have uh, uh, something like a, uh, like a uh, spin density wave uh, kind of uh, transition that would happen here. This is not necessarily ruled out uh, by uh, the robustness of the curie ice moment. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, could, uh, we could turn to uh, the morphology, uh, what the crystal structure tells us, and say, well, uh, it could be that it's a one-dimensional system as well, and it's the strength of the 1D fluctuations that almost suppress uh, the magnetic order, leaving only this tiny shred uh, behind. Uh, and so uh, I'll revisit uh, these uh, these um, uh, speculations uh, uh, in uh, subsequent slides. We have, in fact, uh, carried out uh, neutron diffraction experiments uh, on uh, single crystals of, uh, of uh, titanium four magnets bismuth two. Here's an example of the very weak uh, diffraction uh, uh, magnetic diffraction peaks uh, that we uh, that we observed. Um, we did not uh, get deep into the mag uh, to the antiferromagnetic uh, phase. Uh, but the magnetic structure that is determined uh, from uh, a group theory approach uh, shows that it's very simple, uh, that we have antiferromagnetic chains uh, that are ferromagnetically coupled. Uh, that's uh, the magnetic structure that's uh, been uh, determined. Uh, and it's interesting, I think, uh, that the two orbitals uh, that are um, implicated in uh, the magnetism, the dxy and the dx squared minus y squared, are exactly the ones uh, that have uh, their moments in the plane. And that would uh, support uh, this uh, identification. I want to now turn, however, to our new data on, uh, in, which is inelastic neutron scattering uh, measurements. Uh, and uh, this is the work of Sion Ali, who is uh, on this call. He's a postdoc in our group at, uh, at uh, UB State. And I want to say what a tour de force uh, this experiment uh, really uh, has been. And uh, part of that is uh, because of the samples themselves. Um, 
uh, to carry out this uh, this uh, this experiment, uh, Sihong uh, coal lined 400 uh, you know, crystals of titanium. Oh my God! <laughs> yes, let us pause oh, in admiration just for a moment, <laughs> <laughs> and you can see uh, the the these uh, photographs of uh, of uh, the samples uh, just to show uh, that uh, we got uh, um, more than 10 grams of uh, sample uh, in the beam. Uh, this is a picture of the scattering plane, uh, which is determined by the two vectors O well and HHO. Uh, these are the uh, the Bragg peaks uh, that uh, that were observed, uh, and uh, and I would say that uh, they show that the co alignment and the quality of the crystals are both uh, really uh, quite uh, quite excellent. What are what this, are the weaker peaks that you see on that the, the light blue peaks that are sort of these ones. Um, so yeah. those are probably aluminum, uh, or, or uh, those are probably not associated with the, the sample because uh, they don't index to integ uh, integers, and they clearly have some powder broadening. But the rest of the peaks uh, are indexed, uh, and uh, they are they are sharper. Siang, would you like to weigh in on that? I know you're there. Apparently not. Yeah, yes. <laughs> What about the width of the peaks? Uh, do you have an answer for uh, for that question? Uh, the base is very sharp. I think uh, several degrees. Uh, I've got exactly the, the number, but several degrees. So he was asking about these peaks, I think, uh, these these ones uh, that look more powder-like. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is for alo alumno. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Leon. OK. So let's jump right in on uh, the new uh, on the new results. And uh, this uh, this uh, uh, figure here, I think, uh, gives you a good uh, uh, summary. Uh, this is the intensity of scattered neutrons that are sorted as a function of their energy. Uh, so this is neutron energy loss, neutron energy gain, uh, and this is a powder average uh, wave vector. And uh, this experiment was carried out at 0.3 Kelvin deep in the antiferromagnetic phase. Uh, and so. Uh, clearly, we see primarily one thing, uh, which is that there's this strong inelastic uh, excitation uh, that happens near one millivolt. And you can see with your eyes uh, that it's, uh, it, it disperses very little, if at all. Uh, that is, there's no uh, wave vector dependence uh, to this energy. Uh, indeed, of course, uh, we can uh, choose different ranges of Q, like from 0.4 to 0.6, from uh, 0.8 to 0.1. And at these different bins of Q, we can then report the energy dependence of the scattering. And that's shown here in the center uh, panel. Uh, this is, the, these are energy slices at those different values of Q. And you can see the peak energy is always at the same place. Uh, and the widths of these peaks uh, doesn't much change as a function of, of uh, Q either. Indeed, uh, if you fit, uh, the, uh, fit the data to Lorentzians, uh, then uh, those parameters are plotted here on the right-hand side. The black points are the center energy. The red points are the are the widths, and, and indeed, uh, they have uh, very little wave vector dependence. So the energy, uh, the average energy that we find is 0.94 millivolts, uh, and uh, that is uh, attractively close uh, to the exchange energy uh, that we deduced uh, from uh, the susceptibility measurements. And then that would suggest that this inelastic excitation that we see is somehow a single triplet excitation that is driven by that exchange. Uh, so we also see uh, that uh, the width uh, and the energy are comparable. Uh, and so that tells us that those uh, excitations are strongly overdamped, uh, that their lifetimes are, are, are relatively uh, short and they decay into uh, something else. But what's also really important to point out here is what you don't see. If this were a 1D system, then we're told uh, that the spin-ons are amazingly, are, amazing, are amazingly robust. Whether or not you have localized magnetic moments or not, you ought to see spin-ons. Uh, and we see nothing that disperses, so we surely don't see spin-ons. If this were alternatively a three-dimensionally ordered system uh, that is just a conventional antiferromagnet, we'd expect to see spin waves, and we surely don't see that either. Uh, and so uh, from that, uh, from both respects, um, uh, what we're seeing is a system that is presumably has very localized uh, physics. Can I just ask, so you've ruled out crystal field excitations by your identification of an S equals a half state, is that? Yeah, that's right. And 
how, how just remind us how you identified that state again as being s equals half uh, that came from the um, from the uh, uh, magnetic susceptibility, and I think you'll see in a minute from the sun world that there's a additional uh, support that the state is going to have to. Yeah, and when you say s equals a half, did you mean that l is equal to zero, or did you mean it's j equals a half? Well, uh, I think that those are spin-only states. This is manganese, right? Uh, yeah. So, so that yeah, so the deep, so the or orbital stuff is all quenched. So the other thing that you can notice uh, about these data would be uh, that there's the, the, the intensity of, of, uh, of the scattering also changes. Uh, the intensity of the inelastic scattering uh, also is strongly Q dependent itself. This is the magnetic form factor. Uh, and so um, of course uh, you, you know uh, that uh, the form factor is the Fourier transform of the magnetization density. So if you had, for instance, a manganese two plus ion just sitting in free space, uh, it would have a certain uh, it would have a certain form factor, and uh, that's uh, uh, depicted in this uh, in this figure by this uh, green uh, by this green line. It's a relatively weak Q dependence, and that's not surprising uh, because it uh, because uh, the magnetization of an atom is quite localized, uh, and so when you Fourier transform uh, something that's quite localized, you get something that's quite uh, broad with respect uh, to wave vector. On the other hand, uh, if we were to look at this intensity as a function of Q, uh, those are the stars that are plotted here, uh, we can see uh, that the magnetization drops off much more quickly than, uh, that, than that of the individual atom. Uh, and so that tells us that the magnetization in this system is more spatially extended uh, than in a free atom. Uh, of course, one could uh, simply say, well, it's, it's, it's in a lattice. Uh, the manganese are close to each other. There's hybridization. And so those sorts of band structure effects uh, can be uh, reflected uh, in uh, the form factor itself. Uh, and uh, and uh, certainly that, uh, that is uh, the case. But that sort of an effect uh, tends to be temperature independent. Uh, and I guess I'm giving away the answer by telling you that, uh, uh, that uh, that's not uh, the case uh, in this material. So more likely uh, is uh, that the excitations are occurring in small clusters, in small clusters. Uh, and, uh, uh, and to get some idea about what the average size of those clusters would be, uh, we have fitted um, the, uh, the, the form factor data here just to a Lorentzian. Uh, and uh, it tells us that the clusters are in fact very small, uh, uh, so let's say around six angstroms, which is no more than a few uh, manganese uh, spacings. Uh, so it's very tempting, I would say, uh, to, uh, to say uh, that uh, there's some form of dimerization, you know, more or less that forms along uh, the axis, uh, and that the exchange field uh, is, uh, uh, is, allows that dimer uh, to experience the difference between the singlet and the triplet um, uh, state. Uh, but that's, uh, I think, uh, speculation at this point in this talk. Uh, so now we're going to turn to the single crystal data to see if there's any anisotropy uh, in uh, those uh, short range correlations. Uh, and so uh, this is the scattering plane again, OOL and HHO. And uh, here we have integrated uh, over the, uh, one, uh, that one millivolt uh, energy range. Uh, and so what we can do is we can uh, scan along L uh, or we can scan along HH. So here's what we find when we scan along L uh, and we're avoiding uh, this uh, intense uh, direct beam. Uh, and uh, what you see uh, is uh, that the intensity is peaked up around L equals zero. On the other hand, if we scan along HH, uh, we find a much more homogeneous distribution, a much more uniform distribution of uh, intensity. Uh, there is a dip in the intensity here near 1.5, H equals 1.5. Uh, this is a known effect. Uh, this has to do with the fact that we have a slab-like geometry and there's absorption at these ranges of angles uh, that suppresses the scattering. So the conclusion that uh, we, we could uh, make from this is that along the chain direction, uh, there is some degree of modulation, uh, but that, this, um, uh, that the breadth of this uh, scattering is that corresponds to that six angstroms that I showed you on the last uh, slide. On the other hand, if we look perpendicular uh, to the chain axis, we see a much more uniform uh, scattering. Uh, which tells us that the spatial correlations are more uh, limited uh, in uh, that uh, direction. Uh, so 
uh, that's some level of support uh, that this is a one dimensional system, uh, the signature of which is there's no dispersion perpendicular to the chains. Uh, but uh, the kicker is, unfortunately, in this system, there's really not very much correlations along the chain either, uh, slightly more, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but less. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, figure at the, at the right uh, compares uh, the two form factors in the two directions uh, that uh, just gives you a bit more uh, quantitative um, information. So that's an interesting um, state of affairs. Uh, and so next, uh, what we'll do is we'll turn to the temperature dependence, uh, which is outlined here. Uh, these are those uh, that the same, um, uh, you know, this is, uh, these are the, the same data. Uh, and we're going from uh, 0.3 Kelvin in the antiferromagnetic phase uh, to the onset of antiferromagnetic order, uh, clear up to 100 degrees, uh, which is well above uh, the nail temperature. And I think that up to five degrees or so, maybe even 10 degrees with your eye, you can still see uh, the inelastic uh, scattering is present, uh, but that you also see the growth of this quasi-elastic scattering uh, that grows up with increasing temperature. Uh, and so those two things are not uh, unrelated uh, to each other. Uh, so what we've done here is we've integrated over the horizontal axis uh, Q and reported the energy dependence at the different temperatures. Uh, so in the antiferromagnetic phase, uh, you can see uh, the inelastic peak uh, that we were talking about, uh, and, uh, and it uh, doesn't change, uh, its position doesn't change significantly as a function of temperature, nor does its width. Uh, but with increased temperature, it starts to soften, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and once you get below 5 Kelvin, I think above 5 Kelvin, uh, you need to uh, do uh, curve fitting uh, to uh, get anything uh, useful uh, about that and the quasi-elastic scattering uh, as well. Uh, so I think that the idea here is that we have an inelastic peak whose lifetime uh, uh, shortens as you raise the temperature, uh, and that leads to the formation of the so-called central peak, the quasi-elastic scattering, uh, which represents the relaxation uh, of that mode uh, and which grows uh, thermally uh, as you increase the temperature. So uh, here I'll show you uh, that uh, how we've used uh, some curve fitting to be able to uh, report on the properties of the quasi-elastic and inelastic scattering. Uh, here are the data at 5 Kelvin, and you can see the green uh, is uh, a fit uh, to the uh, inelastic peak, uh, while uh, the pink is the quasi-elastic peak. Uh, and so what I've uh, reported, uh, so we've repeated this process. Here are the, here are the data at 10 Kelvin uh, that show you that you still see uh, this inelastic peak. Uh, and so what we've reported here is uh, the energy for the inelastic peak, which is more or less constant inside the antiferromagnetic phase, uh, but it drops off considerably as you raise the temperature. Uh, I think that uh, we don't really uh, necessarily want to uh, go to the mat uh, for whether uh, there's a, whether the inelastic energy is zero or non-zero at 25 Kelvin. I'll just show you the data and, uh, and you can determine for yourself uh, whether it's uh, actually required uh, that we need an, another inelastic peak to fit the data. Uh, but if so, at 25 Kelvin, if there is an inelastic uh, uh, excitation, uh, the energy is, ver is, uh, is very low. So it was a little bit of a surprise to us uh, that the exchange uh, uh, was uh, temperature dependent, and it suggests uh, that there must be some sort of a phase transition uh, that happens, uh, uh, let's say, uh, near 25 Kelvin or possibly between 10 and 25 Kelvin, uh, that that uh, provide uh, that exchange field that provides that exchange field. Uh, here is the here's the full width half maximum uh, for the inelastic feature, and uh, as well uh, for the uh, uh, quasi elastic scattering. Uh, the quasi elastic scattering uh, really turns on uh, as you uh, increase uh, the uh, the temperature, uh, but the temperature dependence of the inelastic width is actually quite uh, is actually quite uh, gentle. And what's really important to notice is uh, that it's uh, that that, that uh, its lifetime is is actually uh, pretty short, uh, even once you get inside the antiferromagnetic uh, phase. And that was, I, I would say, uh, somewhat uh, uh, somewhat uh, unexpected. Uh, and so the overall picture uh, that uh, I think uh, is uh, proposed here is uh, that there's the uh, uh, the introduction of an exchange field at some temperature between 10 and 30 degrees, let's say, uh, which corresponds, uh, that would correspond to long range order inside the chain if the chain were able to sustain long range order. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 
uh, the chain on short length scales does know about this exchange field, although whether or not uh, a, a, an individual region of the chain is in a singlet or a triplet state uh, is, uh, is uh, somewhat random. So uh, hmm, given the shortage of the time, I think I'll, I'll push on and uh, I won't, uh, I won't uh, uh, deal with this uh, particular one. And uh, now I'll just uh, start to uh, wrap up by telling you uh, about, um, uh, about uh, uh, how we think uh, magnetic order uh, occurs in this material. So this is uh, the plot uh, of the fluctuating moment. Uh, this comes from integrating over the energies and wave vectors uh, that are accessible to us uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, we, and uh, uh, we've normalized these data in absolute units so that you can see uh, that in this range of uh, temperatures uh, that we have um, a fair part, uh, so that would be uh, 1.3 out of 1.8, uh, that is two thirds uh, of the uh, Curie-Weiss moment uh, is, rep is represented in this fluctuating moment. Uh, so I would say the sum rule is nearly satisfied. Uh, that uh, most of the most of the manganese uh, scattering uh, uh, occurs uh, in in the window that I showed you, and in particular, um, we have looked at higher energy uh, uh, transfers. We see no magnetic excitations, uh, although we see lots of phonons. Uh, so the other thing that you can see is that as you lower the temperature, there's a drop of about 0.2 Bohr magnetons. Uh, in uh, the fluctuating moment as you enter into the antiferromagnetic uh, uh, um, state. Uh, and that's very similar to the size of the uh, magnetic moment uh, that we would have deduced, uh, the antiferromagnetic moment that we would have deduced from entropy. And so this is explained then by the formation of antiferromagnetic Bragg peaks. Uh, and of course, importantly, we have a very robust fluctuating moment uh, that is still present uh, at, uh, within the antiferromagnetic state. Uh, so that's a uh, uh, so I, I uh, thought that it would be useful to try to show you this, uh, you know, in some sort of uh, illustration. Uh, and so um, uh, here goes. Uh, this is an individual chain uh, and uh, we're below, uh, we're uh, in this range. Uh, there's no antiferromagnetic order yet. Uh, and uh, the chain breaks up into regions where you have either a singlet state or a triplet state. This is just a snapshot at a particular instant in time. If I look at a later time, things will have changed. They change, they change again. These are at uh, subsequent times. Uh, and if we look at enough times, uh, you can see that the chain is cycling among its different configurations. And the overall system uh, is uh, doing that on a macro level uh, as well. Uh, and so this is above the nail temperature and, and we, can, uh, we can see uh, this is what the nature of, uh, of the uh, strong fluctuations are uh, in the system. Uh, if you uh, then, if we imagine building on top of that the antiferromagnetic order, this is now a picture of the sample at, at a particular instant in time. Uh, you could imagine uh, that in the antiferromagnetic state, at least for a moment in time and for a certain uh, uh, finite range of, of uh, distances, that you could have bona fide antiferromagnetic order. Uh, and that uh, statistically speaking, at every instant in time, there's some fraction of the sample which is ordered uh, by some standard uh, like this. Uh, and so that's uh, this antiferromagnetic order uh, is driven, of course, uh, by the, um, uh, the uh, weak interchain coupling uh, that drives the transition uh, to order at the lowest temperatures. So the sequence of events would be that above 50 Kelvin, we have a curie vice susceptibility. Uh, however, the neutron scattering tells us uh, that there are small isotropic clusters uh, that are present uh, that are presumably uh, parts of the ordered state uh, that uh, are present um, uh, in a metastable sense uh, above the ordering temperature. Uh, once we are below uh, 30 Kelvin, uh, we start to see the, the chains uh, that have individual uh, fluctuations uh, among which parts of them uh, are singlets and triplets. And finally, uh, we get some quasi-static order uh, that happens uh, below 2 Kelvin. Uh, but yeah, I think sorry, that- Sorry, very, very short question, Megan. When yeah. you're speaking about singlet and triplet, is it singlet and triplet of single magnetic ions or it's, for example, dimers, which may be uh, two, neighboring magnets, which may be in singlet and triplet state. What do you have in mind? What do you call singlet and triplet? Otherwise, it's a kind of so, <laughs> uh, to understand what you have in mind. Yeah, uh, excellent question. One that I've thought about many times. And so if the manganese uh, moments are in fact completely uh, localized, uh, then 
um, the, then uh, the neutron scattering tells us uh, that the length scale uh, is something like a dimer. And so then that would, that would, uh, that would be uh, the, the source of the excitation. Alternatively, if the manganese moments are somewhat more dis, uh, diffuse, uh, then the nature of the singlet and the triplet is more complex. Uh, it, it's, um, yeah, it's-, it's uh, Once again, of single side or two side singlet triplet. What do you have in mind really? Single side or two sides? I'm sorry, I didn't understand which side or which side. I... Manganese, manganese. A single manganese may be single triple state in principle, or two neighboring manganese may form uh, well, not real dimer, but some correlated state, which may be correlated singlet way or triplet way. So what do you have in mind? What do you call single triplet? I think single those side are the... triplet, Single side triplet and then, or double side triplet and then. Right. Uh, so I lean towards the double site because I think that the manganese moments are relatively uh, localized. We yeah, have, in mind, we have in mind correlations between neighboring sites, two neighboring mm -hmm. sites. So what uh, you call just, uh, uh, different yes. colors, your, just your, blocks, sites. your blocks of different colors, that's actually blocks containing, each of them containing two neighboring manganese ions, either with, in single state or in triple state. That's what you have in mind. Given the crudeness of how we've analyzed uh, the neutron scattering so far, all we know is that there's a length scale of, let's say, six angstroms, which is, uh, which is uh, close to uh, the, uh, uh, twice the spacing of uh, manganese. So that would, give you, um, uh, that would give you a pair of manganese uh, moments, two. Okay. That's what we know at this point. So I'd just uh, like to uh, wrap up. I see that I've uh, run out my time, uh, and uh, uh, but uh, I would just say that we designed this material in a, uh, in, a, in a certain sense, or at least we looked for this material based on what we wanted it to look like. Uh, and I think that we came up with a really uh, unusual material, but whether in fact it is quasi one dimensional uh, and uh, with moments at the point of localization uh, hasn't yet uh, really been uh, established as fully as it might. It is, however, a rare example of a low spin manganese based system. Uh, the manganese moments do appear to be robust or, uh, or localized, uh, but uh, mysteriously, the magnetic correlations are always uh, very short ranged. Uh, and that's, uh, and that, that whatever correlations we have are along the chain axis perpendicular uh, to the chains. There seems to be, uh, th there seems to be very little um, uh, 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 dispersion. Uh, however, uh, the surprise is that given how close the manganese moments are together uh, and the strong magnetic character uh, and, uh, and knowing uh, that magnetic order uh, does occur, we didn't see spin waves, we didn't see spin ons. All we saw were very localized uh, excitations. And so we propose that the magnetic order happens through a two-step process uh, where initially an exchange interaction is established along the chains, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, whether or not you're in a singlet or a triplet state uh, uh, happens, uh, uh, is decided on a very short uh, length scale. And then at a lower temperature, the residual interactions between the chains drives magnetic order. But this is about as weak of magnetic order as you could uh, possibly uh, think of, uh, that it's uh, barely holding together. And what's really important here are the fluctuations. And that's true both in the ordered state and in the disordered state, almost the same. Uh, and uh, so that, it, uh, that is uh, clearly uh, leading to a strong frustration of uh, the magnetic order. Uh, so we still have a lot of hope for this material as possibly being something like a spin chain spin liquid. Uh, and uh, the question I think uh, that we need to work on, on going forward is uh, the criticality of the moments uh, and uh, where they lie uh, in terms of being localized or, or not. And so we, uh, if, uh, if they can be separated uh, from the conduction electron C, they're embedded in that conduction electron C. What are the properties of that C? Are they one-dimensional? Are they three-dimensional? Uh, and so there are uh, important questions uh, that uh, are underway. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Megan. If the people in London at least can unmute and we can give you a, just a, a taste of a round of applause. Um, but, Thank, thank you very much for that very nice um, talk. Um, going from materials, dis, well, m materials proposal to discovery and to um, finding some uh, interesting physics. So it's now open to questions. If people would like to raise their hand or put a question in in the chat, 
Um, just to kick off, I take it with the neutron scattering, you haven't been able to go below 2 Kelvin to actually uh, investigate um, what the antiferromagnetic order actually is. Yeah, the neutron diffraction. Oh, it's a sad story. Not once, but twice. That uh, sample was lost by FedEx. <laughs> oh dear! That. Well, thanks. So, I wouldn't be using them. <laughs> there's no reason why we can't do it, uh, other than uh, well, I think we're going to have to send a courier to Oak Ridge to do the experiment. <laughs> yeah, we need to do that. Yeah. So I think um, there's another comment uh, or a question from uh, Daniel uh, Komsky. So if you'd like to unmute Daniel and ask your question. Uh, okay. Uh, the first, maybe a short comment. Uh, you just uh, spoke in the beginning about uh, high spin state and low spin state manganese. But I think that uh, this notion of low spin manganese, manganese 2 plus, is, uh, well, it's never the case. <laughs> it's never the case. It may be that it looks like a small spin, uh, strongly reduced because of the localization of other electrons. For mm -hmm. example, it may be a perfect example of what people call orbital selective mode transition. For example, two orbitals for x, y, and x, y, minus y are localized. Other electrons are delocalized, especially by the way, because your distance is, uh, is, is extremely short. It's actually, what it is, 2.4, yeah? Because in manganese metal, manganese, manganese distance is 273. So it's much shorter than distance manganese, manganese distance in manganese metal. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, actually, it might well be indeed that uh, there is very strong localization of orbitals directly along the chains, but maybe more localized character of orbitals perpendicular to the chains, which may uh, essentially uh, give you something resembling spin one half, but it's nothing to do with spin, a slow spin state. They simply uh, completely wrong terminology, I would say. Now, my question actually in this context, you uh, estimated uh, your moment from susceptibility. But what about neutrons, especially if you use your uh, new kind of updated updated form factor? What uh, would be the moment which you obtain from neutrons? Um, so the moment that we obtain from neutrons is shown here. Um, this this is the this is the fluctuating moment that you get by integrating over the energies and wave vectors and averaging over wave vectors uh, that's associated with the millivolt peak. And so to the extent that um, this is close to the Curie-Weiss moment, uh, we can say that we've captured most of the fluctuating um, uh, manganese uh, here. So is this not what you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. No, okay, very good. And now uh, maybe just a very short question uh, in addition. Uh, you just uh, mentioned, uh, spoke at least in your slides, it was written dimers. Are there any uh, indication? Maybe there is indeed something with the structure uh, at low temperatures, something like, if not piles, but spin piles, something like that, or there is not nothing happening in the structure. Indeed, uh, you know, certainly one of the things that you're going to um, suspect uh, if you have a itinerant system that's one day uh, that there should be nesting, and uh, it, you know you would expect to have a piles distortion, and that would be another way to think about uh, the dimer. You know, it, it's it's uh, grafting a localized picture onto a delocalized uh, sort of physics, but I, I take your point. Yeah, but experimentally, until now, at least there is uh, no indication for or against uh, possible demilitarization. So that would need to come, that would probably need to come uh, from the uh, form factor, and I think you saw the data, uh, and uh, and so probably we're not at the point of uh, you know really being able to uh, to comment on that. Do you have single crystals? Excuse me? Do you have single crystals? Single crystals. Are you working with single crystals? So uh, what about, uh, say, for example, uh, oops. what about, uh, uh, say, thermal expansion, for example? Yeah, that uh, can happen. It, oops, what happened? That would, be a, that would be a good experiment to try. We haven't done it. I mean, at the level at the level of the lattice constants, I don't think there's any evidence in from the neutron scattering, but that's a pretty low bar. Okay, very good. Thank you. Very interesting story. Thank you, Daniel. Um, 
I, I don't see any other questions from other people at the moment, but I have another one. So in the um, uh, start of your talk, uh, you, you showed susceptibility measurements, which had a, a peak at low temperature uh, for one of the um, field directions. Uh, so it suggests that there might be some interesting metamagnetic phenomena in this material. I wondered if you'd investigated and found anything there. My story, I just done sharing. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so did we see metamagnetic? Uh, so no, uh, up to uh, you know the the uh, fields that we can uh, the seven Tesla for the uh, uh, for the magnetometer. Uh, we mm. didn't see any features in the magnetization. Um, yeah. what, what was the what temperature was the peak at in in the data? Sorry, I, it was all very much to the left, so I couldn't quite resolve. I can I can uh, I can uh, find it uh, you know quickly and uh, reshare my screen. I would say. Yeah. Well, it, easier said than done. The peak is at uh, around two Kelvin. Two uh, Kelvin. And, uh, so uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, the same as the peak in the specific peak. Uh, so okay. So. It, Corresponded with your suggested antiferromagnetic transition. I think there's a there's a question from Julian Serini. If you'd like to unmute and ask. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Miriam, for, for the talk. Uh, this subject uh, exceeds my my knowledge, but uh, perhaps I feel like a student, so I, I would like to make some naive questions. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the uh, when one talks about dimers, huh? uh, in this case, perhaps we're going to take it, uh, this pure uh, spin atom with a spin one half that has some um, is isotropic, so it uh, connects with the neighbor. This has the same situation, but then the dimer is no more isotropic, so. What happens with the orbital moment or the equivalent? Is a L equal zero of this uh, new system or there is one non-zero uh, second order orbital moment there? Uh, so I think that, uh, that um, you know, manganese be, uh, being a 3D, uh, probably that uh, the, uh, the uh, angular momentum is quenched. Uh, and so I'm only considering this to be uh, to be spin, and uh, you know I guess uh, I guess that uh, uh, that's uh, a little bit uh, inconsistent with the idea of an orbitally selective uh, transition of some of uh, some sort. So uh, in any case, uh, I I don't really have a, a strong answer other than sort of the obvious one, which is it's a transition metal, uh, and so we would probably think of it as a spin-only state. Yeah, but anyway, uh, in the dimmer we have lost the isotropy. Yeah, because I uh, yeah. and this is uh, makes some difficulties to to. I I think it could be related to the point that Daniel was making as mm -hmm. well, which is that you know if we insist on thinking about it as an insulator, uh, you know, mm -hmm. then we can uh, lead ourselves into uh, you know some uh, some uh, inconsistencies, let's say. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know perhaps it is as he says that it is isotropic, you know, in in the sense that you have a like a Paros kind of distortion. Mm -hmm. And may I just pose a more dynamic uh, question? Is uh, one imagine the dimmer form with uh, two neighbors, but uh, suddenly uh, one of them uh, like to make a dimmer with the, the other neighbor. In the change, you know, yeah. let's just go to left from the right. And this it make a, a more collective situation or more dynamic situation and having uh, this uh, quantum fluctuations around, uh, thermal fluctuations and so on, we can even think in, to form a certain time, period of time, a, a trimmer or something like that. So this is uh, somehow uh, the problem I see this more uh, is faced uh, in a, as a static uh, system, but uh, probably system likes dynamics. And uh, let's say, I, I would call that this a dynamic uh, magnetic coagulation, for example, no? with the, uh, a frequency component or special component and so on. What do you think about this view? I, I think it's a very attractive, uh, it's a really attractive view. And, uh, you know, I, I was trying to represent something like that, I think, in my illustrations, but, you know, I, 
yeah, they were a, a little too crude, I think, to get that. Uh, so I think that, you know, the fact that the correlations remain so short range really does lead you to think about having, you know, something that is not only short range, but as a consequence, it's also dynamical, you know, because the energy barrier, you know, for changing, you know, the state is, uh, is uh, so mm. much, is so much lower. Uh, and so I think it's just barely trying to hold together, you know, uh, magnetically, let's, uh, you know, let's say. Okay. So I agree Thank completely you. with you. I agree completely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, further questions? Uh, could I ask a question, please? Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Um, Meg Megan, uh, you mentioned uh, on, in your work on the one-dimensional ethereum systems that you were unsuccessful in trying to find a system that in which the condo effect actually takes over. Could you tell us a little bit about what the difficulties were and whether you think they might be surmounted in future experiments? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, ha having done the Eutrium 2 Platinum 2 lead experiment, you know, it seemed like the obvious next step would be to try to, you know, sort of change the composition in some way uh, where you would have, um, in that case, the, the equivalent uh, of, uh, of, of chemical pressure. Uh, because that would de that would um, you know uh, enhance the uh, condo effect uh, in the ytterbium, and so you know the uh, as uh, Julian uh, will be able to tell you because he is of course the master of the two two one compounds. Um, uh, you you can absolutely go uh, you know pretty far down that road uh, towards uh, towards uh, mixed uh, mixed uh, valence. Uh, but I think uh, in trying to do that, we always found things uh, where the moment was too delocalized, uh, and uh, we we were never uh, successful in uh, finding something that had the had the steps in the magnetization or the other properties uh, that the Eutrium two platinum two lead had done. And we also found it sort of remarkably hard to do doping experiments and uh, to find pure phases. It was. Yeah, so I'm not saying that we've given up on that. We continue, but uh, we haven't been uh, successful in that yet. Okay, thank you. Okay. I don't see any further questions in um, the chat or any hands raised. Uh, I, I take it Julian's hand is still up from the previous question. Okay, so I, I think if there are no more questions, then we're almost up to time anyway. So I guess I should probably thank Megan again on behalf of us all um, for a very interesting um, talk. Um, so thank you again, uh, Megan, and I will hand back to Pierce, who I guess will take a 10 minute break. Is that right? So over to you. Yes, yeah, first uh, applause. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you for getting up so early in the morning. Well, it would be early for me anyway. Um, uh, and I, Before you all go, I'd like to invite you all to hang around, or at least yeah. to leave your videos on, because we're going to be going over to the prize ceremony. We won't actually start it until uh, 5.30. But if you could hang around, it would be very nice. Uh, uh, so, but we're going to stop the record now, and we're going to be starting the prize student prize ceremony in uh, uh, 10 minutes' time. Thank you very much. <laughs>